so I don't have any presentation, but if either of you have anything to present uh, at the beginning of our uh, talk, uh, you can. And I've got about 15 know. minutes of material. Uh, okay. So please and I, I can make it longer. I can make it shorter. But it just gives uh, a bit I think, of I think, I think 50, 15 minutes is uh, appropriate. In that sense. I could probably, it's probably about 10 minutes, let's be honest. Okay, so let's start. Uh, with I don't know if Marilu has anything. But, uh, oh, well, actually, I thought that given uh, the panel uh, um, format, uh, it would have been a kind of a um, discussion. So I didn't prepare slides. Yeah, no. me neither. Me neither. But uh, I think we, we can actually uh, start. But, with, but I mean, uh, I'm happy to carry uh, goes yeah. on with the yeah. slide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, it, it, I, I think I let me let me present it. It will be rel relatively quick. I don't think it will take up too much time, but I think it will give a bit of a a, a different look um, at at the quantum games. Um, and it is extremely focused on on what we do. Um, and so let, let let's do this. Wonderful. So please share your screen so that yes, we can check. Yes, I will do so as soon as I have it behaving. And now it behaves. And now you should see this. So um, yes, so I'm uh, Carrie Widener. I'm an assistant professor at Aarhus University. Um, I have been here for about three years working with, uh, for example, Jakob Scherson who is a professor and he's the founder and director of the Science at Home uh, initiative, which is where a lot of this comes from. And just so that you know who I'm talking about, that's what, that's what he looks like. So there you go, there's Jakob for you. Um, he's down in my lab, uh, hopefully not turning actu any actual knobs because then I have to realign them. So why, why do we care about quantum games and tools? And a, a lot of this, th this is sort of why I wanted to give this presentation is because a lot of this builds on what uh, Ana Maria and, uh, and, and the other speakers have, have, have talked about. But in, in a lot of ways, the second revolution is coming. It's here, actually. Um, and this is really the, the sort of the second wave of quantum technologies being built based on the new technologies that were developed in the labs over the past you know, 10, 20, 30 some years. And so quantum computing is very much a part of that. Um, and because of that, because there are so many new opportunities with quantum, this actually requires additional educational efforts. And if these educational efforts are not just for, you know, the quantum physicists that live in their little ivory towers and, and do calculations or work in labs um, or the people with PhDs, but also the people that are quantum interested, but maybe not at the level of getting a PhD in quantum mechanics um, and even just general public. You know, people who say, oh, quantum computers, they're interesting, you know. And there's a place in quantum technology for everyone's skill set. I mean, one of the things that Ana Maria mentioned was a game built by designers and programmers, and they didn't even have a, 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 quantum, a quantum physicist on their team, and they were still able to make a quantum game, you know. And so, and so there's, there's a place for people, regardless of your level of, you know, physical, physics expertise. If you want to get involved in quantum, there's a spot for you. And even existing experts, people who think they, you know, who, who are very much specialized in something can learn about unique applications. So there's a lot about quantum technologies that I don't know. And I've been doing this for something like 15 years. And so this requires, you know, inspiring and intuitive representations of quantum mechanics. And that, that's a game, you know, I mean, it's many, many other things also, but it could be a game. And so the, the group that I come from that I've been working with for the past three years, has a lot of games. So here's sort of a list of games you can see on the left. We've got a list of quantum tools and we've got a list of a few initiatives that we've been going through. And, and so that's, that's been something that's been really, really fun to work with is looking at these games. And I'll give you just an insight very briefly into a couple of these games. But I was hoping that my first couple of slides would be able to sort of frame our conversation um, without hopefully driving it and, and uh, making uh, Zeki and Mary Lou very angry at me. Um, so we have, first of all, Quantum Moves 2. That's been, uh, that's sort of our, our, our big flagship game. It's been played by about 250,000 people and it could be 250,020 if you guys all play, if you haven't already. And it's a citizen science game in that it actually allows citizen scientists 
to solve and optimize hard optimization tasks in quantum mechanics. And these all have applications in quantum technologies. So here's an example. This is what the game looks like. Um, I really like uh, the idea of interfacing and good interfacing and making things pretty, um, which is great because I'm the opposite of an artist. And so when people can help me with this, that's great. Um, but effectively, the goal here is that this represents, if you can see my mouse, a, uh, an atom. This is a single atom in a trap that's created by a laser. So we can actually do this. It's, it's a lot of fun. I can do this in the lab. It's great. And what the idea is to actually bring this trap here on the left, and you can move it by clicking on it. And I clicked because that's what I'm, I'm, I want to do. Uh, by moving this trap over and back. And the idea is to try to make move this guy over here. Um, and it, this is actually something that's done in quantum technologies. You want to move, move a qubit from point A to point B. This is the sort of thing that you have to do. Um, and we did some research on this, and I won't belabor the point, but we actually found that players were could be quite efficient. There were some advantages over certain algorithms, not all algorithms, but certain algorithms. And players actually, their solutions could be somewhat more efficient than just like hitting this with a computer really hard. Um, and so I won't uh, belabor the point, but the whole idea was sort of, let's take people's intuition, even people who don't know anything about quantum mechanics and see if that can actually be applied to these games. And that's what, that's what we like to study. Um, and we published on it, it's been fun. Uh, there's another game that we hopefully have coming very soon um, where players can actually help researchers to better understand their data. And so there's a goal of this game is to classify the images that are generated by various theoretical models used to describe how particles like electrons move in highly ordered systems. And this is just jargon for, we want to know how electrons in systems move around. Um, we want to know how, you know, thing, how, how various, you know, materials, how, how, how the, the, the constituent parts of these materials, how these, all, all these little things, how they interact. Um, and this, is, this has nice applications in terms in things like high temperature superconductivity, um, which has you know, great implications for say, you know, the energy crisis and, among, and many other things like materials design and whatnot, you know, the development of all, all of these fun technologies that hopefully we'll get to see in our lifetimes. And the game looks something like this. And the idea is to have players look at this array of, of different colored squares representing you know, electrons in one quantum state, electrons in another quantum state. If you know anything about qubits, you can think of this as a qubit you know, in up or down or something like that, or then the absence of an electron here. And then we, we ask them, you know, what theory does this correspond to? And that you don't have to know anything about the theory, but we just wanna know how you think about and so this is sort of building on this, how do people who aren't necessarily quantum experts build on these? And you know, the idea is, can, you, can your results help artificial intelligence that's been trained on the problem? And so we have some collaborators that have put, up, put together some work there. Um, I'm gonna skip these next couple, um, but we actually, we opened our laboratory to the world and let people play with our, uh, our very cold atoms. Um, and it was, it was quite fun because the players did better than the experimentalists. And we think it's because we gave them a fun little interface to play with. And again, and then we have a tool called the Quantum Composer. If you're interested, uh, take a look. It's actually a way to learn quantum mechanics. And so you can use it to supplement your, you know, learning from a textbook or from YouTube videos or from whatnot. And so uh, it's not quite a game, but it's a fun way to learn. But in summary, really, you know, what we want to do at Science at Home and what I think most people who make quantum games want to do is to make tools that inspire people, that, that help people to, to learn something um, and to have some fun while they're doing it. Um, and we are in particular are interested in how amateurs and experts think about quantum mechanics. And come play our games, they're really fun and hopefully we'll have some more soon. And the, the, the plug here is if you're interested in uh, working with us, reach out to me. And we're, look, we're always looking for excited, interesting people who want to help us make games. And yes, go to scienceathome.org and learn more about everything. So that's my pitch. Those are my actual atoms. They love you. And I'm done. So we'll stop sharing. And now we can have an actual conversation. 
and I'll pop some links in the chat. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, and it's a very nice effort, like allowing people to play with your experiments. Okay, I will take note and add it into the uh, YouTube part as well. Okay, so uh, as you know, uh, our panel's main point is quantum games in the context of education and outreach. But as well, let's say to start the discussion, what do you think is a quantum game or definition of a quantum game? Or can there be a definition of quantum game? Is it too early? Uh, what do you think? I mean, you covered a little bit uh, uh, during the presentation, but still. Is a question to carry, you mean? Or... Uh, both, of, both of you. To, to of both. you. Okay. Why don't you go first, Marilu, because I just took you know, <laughs> 15 minutes of okay. everybody's airs. Uh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, I'm not at all angry with Carrie. Actually, I thank Carrie because she, uh, the way she did, uh, she has introduced uh, already many uh, essential points that, that are important for the for the discussion. So I think uh, uh, definitely think that uh, for now the definition remains uh, quite broad, right? So um, uh, Carrie already Carrie gave I think uh, a, a number of different uh, uh, types of games that are related to the word quantum because they can either be um, ways of I mean like quantum moves uh, ways uh, to uh, to um, solve uh, problems in a playful manner. Uh, but uh, that, that explicitly use uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics rules, uh, or uh, in principle, uh, uh, they uh, they could be um, real games that run uh, onto uh, quantum computers. There are several other examples. Uh, so for now, we think that uh, uh, at this stage, uh, the, the, definition is, the definition is broad and uh, in a way it is an interesting situation because uh, we are on the verge of, um, of uh, better uh, designing the perimeter of, of what uh, uh, we are doing. Uh, we uh, means, I mean, Anna Maria gave uh, a, an example of the huge uh, uh, part of the world that is moving in this direction, fortunately. So um, it is something that uh, is uh, being um, is being uh, promoted and developed uh, in uh, many places in the world for uh, different reasons. Uh, and so I think it's it's a good point uh, that we we can. Uh, we can discuss how to define the different kinds of uh, quantum games. And uh, especially I think that the definition should uh, uh, be designed according to what they are for. So for example, what they are for, are they, are they for education? Are they for uh, research? Uh, are they for um, also for, they, they could be, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very mixing uh, situation, for example, uh, with uh, um, Sabrina Maniscalco and uh, with, I mean, within Q Play Learn, we are pro promoting a, a, um, a project uh, that we submitted to the Tuscany region uh, to use, to develop, uh, develop games, video games that work with quantum rules but they are located in, onto the um, culture uh, places, uh, locations, uh, uh, scientific and artistic locations of the cult cultural heritage of the Tuscany. So uh, games that at the same time allow to explore uh, a cultural heritage and also to learn uh, some uh, quantum rules. Uh, so this is a kind of game that is uh, developed with the purpose of education, but also with the purpose of uh, uh, de development and promotion of uh, fostering Uturk. culture. Uturk. Um, 
Yeah, that, that was someone's Sorry, microphone. Was someone yeah. with microphone open, uh, switched yeah. on. <laughs> so um, depending on the on what they are for, I think that we can uh, proceed to define them. And also what uh, I, I launch uh, one more uh, topic for the discussion. Uh, that is uh, something we are discussing also within uh, the pilot uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, coordinating with Zeki on uh, outreach and, edu uh, and uh, education of the, uh, of the coordination support action on quantum edu uh, education, technologies education. So one other point is about how we measure the effectiveness of uh, these games we design for the purpose they have been designed uh, uh, for. So it, it, because uh, very often they are, I mean, it's possible that they are designed just for fun, okay? And that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a player, uh, a very, uh, a very um, uh, happy player of any kind of game, uh, but uh, very often they are designed with a purpose. And so if they are designed with a purpose, so we have to ask ourselves how we are going to measure how effective these uh, games are for the purpose they are designed for. Yes. So this is one more uh, question for, for us. Yes, there's, there's, it, there really is a challenge. I mean, you can, you can make games um, and, you know, based on the, 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 the review that was done by, uh, by, um, by Ana Maria and Anant and, and, uh, and the, two, the team there, um, there are a lot of games that are quantum in some way. You know, maybe they use Kiskit um, or they're built on Kiskit or they make use of or illustrate some sort of quantum principle. And, but then there really is the question of how useful are they at, at reaching the goal? And the goal could just be fun. And then the question is simply, is the game fun? Because that's, that's, if that's what it takes, you know, and I often think that if I had known that quantum mechanics was a thing, that I could, ha I could have been a scientist when I was eight years old, as opposed to when I actually did learn when I was much older, you know, how much different would my life be? Um, and, and so because of that, I, I really, you know, appreciate the idea of reaching out to um, to people and, and, and different communities. I mean, Paolo put a question in the chat about uh, using these games in Latin American communities. And I, I admit that I, I don't know entirely what you mean by do not know about fear, but want to know reinforced knowledge of quantum. I mean, th there is something to be said for reaching communities outside of the, the big quantum hubs that exist in Europe, in the US, in China, Japan, Australia, but but the, the, the places that you wouldn't necessarily think of, because it doesn't, it's not that there are, that, that genius is concentrated in Germany, you know, around the Max Planck Institutes, it's, and genius isn't even required, it just requires a little bit of, you know, passion and a bit of hard work to be a quantum physicist, and even if you don't want to be a quantum physicist, there's something to be said for being interested. And I feel like I'm kind of going a bit off on a tangent here, but if you want your game, if you want to design your game with some sort of goal in mind, some sort of learning goal and some sort of, or some sort of research goal. And of course, because it's a game, you want it to be fun in some way. Um, then you, you, you really have to do some, you know, if you, if you want to really, validate that you have to do some studies you have to ask players what they think or ask players what they uh um what they want and what they've learned you have to maybe measure what they've learned and that's non-trivial um but at the same time you should really think about the community that you're trying to reach um and, and i think i think my uh um initiative regarding science quantum science and cultural heritage in tuscany i mean that's beautiful and so what you can really do is you, you have to work locally. And, you know, you say, ah, but I'm in, you know, for example, I'm in Denmark and you're in Latin America. 
Well, if there's one thing that this global pandemic has taught us, it's that we can do a lot over the internet. And so, you know, reaching out locally, you know, maybe I don't know the local language or, well, okay, if I try to speak Spanish, I'm going to stumble miserably and everything's going to come out Danish. But, uh, you know, you could still work with people and you can still work to get local translations going and you can provide educational material that then gets translated. And so that's how I would really encourage these things. Yeah, thank you. Um, I completely agree with both of you. Uh, but I do have another, uh, let's say, idea or approach regarding how to assess these quantum games. And that is, should we really need to focus on the, let's say, purpose or the goal of the creator? Or should we focus on assessment tools that are independent of the mindset of the creator? So say you have a test and the test actually shows any player uh, or allows us to assess whether any player gained some quantum mechanical intuitions as they play the game a certain period of time. And if we can develop certain assessment tools, can you hear me? It says my internet connections. Uh, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit uh, delayed uh, for for a while, but now it's okay. Okay, I turned off my camera. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will keep it short. Uh, regarding the assessment tools, what do you think about uh, trying to develop certain assessment tools that are, let's say, purpose-free or type-free? So we can use these type of tools for any kind of game that argues it is a quantum game. And if people play those games later, uh, solve those tests, and we can assess whether they gain certain quantum mechanical intuition or not. But oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, this is, I mean, um, if, uh, if the game is not designed with uh, uh, a purpose, uh, it, it is uh, still, it can still be designed with the purpose of fun. <laughs> it is a purpose anyway. And so we can uh, imagine uh, to, uh, to, the, to the design, uh, to conceive uh, um, some measurement tools uh, just for the basic uh, functions uh, of the game. And then uh, uh, on top of that, uh, uh, think about uh, uh, other uh, assessment tools that, of course, uh, they will depend specifically on the purpose uh, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, considered. Uh, for example, what we're we doing uh, now with, um, we also published a, a, a first paper and we are preparing a second one with uh, uh, Sabrina, Caterina and uh, Dana Foti, the director of QPlay Learn, and uh, uh, Marisa Michelini, she's a uh, full professor uh, on physics education research at the University of Udine in Italy. Uh, we, are, um, we are making uh, some uh, experiences in high schools in Italy. Uh, and in one of these, uh, uh, we used uh, uh, the quantum tic-tac-toe uh, to, um, uh, to discuss with students, uh, with high school students, uh, um, the basic uh, concepts, uh, uh, especially quantum state uh, measurement, uh, quantum superposition and entanglement of quantum mechanics. And uh, um, we did it, uh, uh, we did this uh, without uh, delivering first uh, a, a different, I mean, a, a lecture, a traditional, a conventional lecture and uh, uh, while uh, uh, delivering before the playing of the game uh, a, a traditional uh, lecture or on quantum, basic lecture on quantum mechanics. Uh, and we uh, are finding, I mean, we have preliminary results of this kind of uh, assessment, uh, um, but uh, we, we can already say that uh, Students uh, are absolutely um, very, uh, first of all, they, they are completely engaged 
uh, when we use uh, uh, these uh, games uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, quantum concepts uh, in, the, in, in the lecture. And the second, uh, that in fact, uh, they uh, have expi explicitly uh, used the strategies uh, um, with which they played the game uh, to have a better and deeper understanding about the concepts. Uh, so we, uh, I, I, I mean, I have not slides now about these preliminary results, but I can already anticipate uh, this. And so, uh, after all, I, I think that um, that, for example, in this case, we devised, we designed some specific uh, um, assessment uh, assessment tools, uh, and I think that that they did something that can be uh, quite um, really quite useful. Uh, another uh, uh, another uh, situation in which uh, and then uh, and then I stop. <laughs> uh, another situation in which I think that can be really useful to um, also to design uh, these assessment tools and use uh, while using uh, quantum games. Uh, uh, besides the cultural heritage that uh, Carrie also was uh, um, uh, remarking, uh, is about outreaching. Uh, because, uh, for example, one other um, uh, initiative that we're taking with, uh, within QPlay Learn is uh, uh, the realization of uh, the so-called quantum jungle. This is an installation uh, that will go into a kind of a, uh, of a hands-on museum. The, um, the installation will be realized by the artist Robin Baumgarten, and uh, he has already done the Quantum Garden. So this is a set, a large set, a large graph network of LEDs and springs that allows uh, to visualize uh, the dynamics, uh, the dynamical evolution of a quantum state at, on a large, say, panel of uh, two by three meters, for example. And uh, this is something, uh, this is a wonderful tool for outreaching, uh, um, for, for, for outreaching, for example, uh, uh, research uh, problems and research results. And uh, one, uh, uh, and, and again, uh, understanding to which extent this way of, so the, the use of these uh, quantum games, because we could define also this one as a quantum game, in fact, the use of this quantum game can be uh, uh, really useful to outreach the scientific, uh, maybe complex scientific messages you are uh, trying to convey is uh, another, uh, another question mark. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree. I mean, and this is, I, I, as, as, I, as I talk, I'm going to try to address a couple of the questions here that were put in the chat, but I think that Marie-Lou really has, in many ways, started to discuss this. Um, in, in, terms of, in, in terms of building a quantum game, there, again, I, I, when I say all of this, I want to say that you could absolutely just develop a game because you think it's fun. And there, you, you, you have no, no obligation beyond that. However, if you want to develop a game for some sort of educational purpose, you know, just so that people have fun, but they also learn something, or they have fun and they contribute to citizen science and they also learn something, then you have to develop as well, and almost even alongside the game, um, you have to develop some educational material. Um, because it is extremely difficult to simply just play a game and learn quantum. Um, you, 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 it, it, it is extremely difficult. Um, you know, you can play quantum moves and you can become an expert <laughs> at quantum moves and not understand a thing about what is actually going on and why, why I actually care about moving this little, you know, thing from one place to another. And so, you know, we, we, we have to, if we want to use these games to educate, you have to develop this, the material surrounding it. And it's even better if you can validate the material surrounding it by doing the kind of education research that Marilu was talking about. Um, now, you know, one of, the things, one of the things about that that I, I don't know that I necessarily want to call it a, a, a problem, but one of the, the, the problems 
about that is that it takes time and it takes effort to develop these games. And so, you know, I, I'll give an example from myself. I'm, you know, I'm an experimental physicist. I, I, I have a, a lab in the basement where I try to do this type of high, you know, world-class research that I that I love, but I also want to develop games. And so I have to balance my time between, you know, being a physicist that does experiments and being a physicist that builds games for education. Um, and so that that's absolutely um, what I think is going on here. Um, and to address another question, you know, th that's why there needs to be a community surrounding this. You know, I feel like that, that it is a bit siloed. You know, there's a, a big initiative in Finland, which thankfully is spreading out throughout Europe. Um, and, and then, the, you know, the initiatives in Italy, the initiative in Denmark, the initiative in, in, in Poland and with QWorld and whatnot. And so what we really need to do is we need to reach out to each other. And again, I just mentioned a whole bunch of initiatives in Europe. Like let's not even talk about initiatives in India and in China and Japan and in the, the U.S. You know, you know, let, let, let's try to build this network because somebody can build a game, for example, at a hackathon. And somebody else can say, you know, I know how I can use this game in my classroom. Let me develop some material. Let's get together, you know, and we can write a paper about it and submit it to, you know, some sort of educational journal, you know, ideally in some sort of open access way that high school teachers and high school students and university teachers can can read and they can learn about these things. Now, of course, the issue is that that takes time. And it, it's, you know, depending on your opinion on things, it's possibly less fun than, you know, actually programming kids kits so that now you have quantum checkers, which, you know, I completely agree. That's super fun. Um, and then uh, just w one more thing that I wanted to make sure I addressed um, is the, the barrier that is stopping quantum computing from being available to a wider audience, for example, university level learning. And is it that the same for wider use? And you know, do you, as a linked question, do you feel the use of bigger machines via the cloud is the answer? Um, I could probably talk for about two hours about this and I'm not gonna do that, you're welcome. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the barrier largely is awareness and literacy. And quantum literacy can take many forms. You know, I have a PhD, I hope I'm quantum literate, but that doesn't mean that a high school student can't achieve some sort of quantum literacy. You know, some sort of quantum, you know, and that's that sort of educate and inspire aspect of it. Um, so I think the barrier is really the time and the effort that people put into developing educational material at different levels. And you know, IBM and McKiskit, for example, do a fantastic job of that. QWorld does a fantastic job of that. You know, we at Science at Home, you know, we, we're trying to do a fantastic job of that. QPlay Learn, likewise. You know, and so uh, I, I think that you know, the development of that kind of material is really the barrier. And then the use of bigger machines via the cloud. I love cloud-based quantum experiments. I want to build them and use them for the rest of my career. Um, and one of the, the biggest issue with it is really scalability so that you're not sitting in a queue for eight hours, um, but virtual laboratories, virtual experiments that really, you know, quantum computing simulators, you know, I, I don't do quantum computing. I, I play with very, very cold atoms, um, but simulators of those types of systems um, that can help build people up so that then when they say, okay, now I want to use the real system, they know, you know, they, they, they have the background that they need so that they can do really fun stuff and they can learn. Um, and so I, I, I don't think it's the answer, but I think it's an important part of an answer. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Uh, I, I, I really do believe that the community aspect is really important and as new uh, initiatives start popping up around the world we need some way to you know get in touch or uh, at least uh, i don't know i don't think there, there are many ways to find out new communities unless they do events like this or they publish certain papers or they join uh any conferences but there should be because i mean we are living we have been living mostly online for the last one and a half years and yeah so i think we should develop some kind of a newsletter or some kind of discourse or something
something like that. Zeki, can you know. kill your video uh, again? Because you're breaking up a little. I, and I want to hear I what you have, have to say. I have a question for both of you. And... Uh, Zeki, okay. uh, if you can switch uh, off your video, because, uh, so because the question is, your voice is What counted. do you think about... Oh, it, it is off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Should I should I repeat what I said or yeah, should I ask the so. question? Yes, please. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, so the idea was basically there are many communities popping up and we should figure out a way to learn about these new communities as they pop up because we have been living in this online world for the one uh, for the last one and a half years. And uh, unless they do certain events, they join certain conferences or publish papers, it is really hard to keep up with uh, what is happening globally. Uh, so that was the idea. And the question uh, for you or the participants or anyone who wants is, how? what do you think about the connection or the lack of connection between the gaming industry and uh, quantum games currently? Because for the most of the community, uh, I think it is rightfully so uh, for research and education purposes. But I think it is kind of a novelty that gaming industry can use, right? They don't actually need quantum computers to incorporate certain quantum aspects to their games. And since these are novel mechanics, maybe they can be used for, especially in the fields of like casual games, hyper casual games, which are rather easier to, you know, complete as games. Because otherwise, if you want to do a strategy game or a longer game, then yes, of course, it's a high risk. But but for hyper casual games, I'm I'm really surprised that uh, not many firms are. Uh, interest in this what do you think so um i think that one answer uh, goes in uh, the direction of what uh, carrie was uh, saying before uh, so the point is that uh, again uh, the, the, these quantum games uh, now given all the various examples that we have uh, uh, that, that we have uh, that, that popped out in in these discussions we had so far. Uh, I mean, you can imagine to enjoy a quantum game uh, just for fun, and this can be can be a lot of fun because uh, the rules are really unusual rules and rules uh, uh, which uh, we are not. Uh, um, conventionally, um, uh, we have no conventional experience about. Uh, so for example, in the case of the quantum jungle, you can just remain immersed in these uh, LEDs uh, which uh, switch on and off and can be just an immersive experience, a sensorial immersive experience. And this can be just fun or uh, just fun uh, when you play a quantum game, again, just for fun, but still uh, is really, uh, uh, is a lot more fun than with classical uh, based, uh, so games cl based on classical rules, because you can do uh, kind of magic things, magic for same popular, uh, popular manner as a popular term, uh, you can uh, use them uh, for uh, education in the way we said, and you can also use them to solve uh, problems that are not uh, necessarily physics problems. They could also be problems uh, in, a war in a job environment that has nothing to do with physics, but since you are using a game which, which in turn uses quantum rules, and quantum rules are really weird, you are going to switch on a creative way of thinking and an imaginative way of thinking that can be very, very, very useful. So the point, uh, going back to your question, the point is that uh, until we do not uh, uh, refine our ability and capacity to outreach this uh, idea, 
So that quantum physics uh, is a different and a new way of thinking that is uh, really unconventional uh, and uh, is uh, a way of any experience uh, of, uh, of ours, uh, just to use a completely new way of thinking, just to use the words of Tony Leggett, for example, um, until we are not able uh, to uh, uh, outreach this uh, uh, and convey this uh, simple message to everyone in the world, uh, it will be hard uh, thinking that um, companies, uh, game companies, uh, will uh, uh, invest uh, into into this uh, in the, the development of quantum of quantum games. Uh, I mean, uh, beyond and uh, outside. Uh, uh, the perimeter of research and uh, of the interaction with uh, universities. So, for example, in the in the realization of quantum games uh, of uh, quantum sorry quantum game jumps, we there, there, there are many in the world. We are going to organize another one, a second one here in Pisa with uh, within the Internet Festival in October. We will keep you posted with uh, everyone posted with it. So if you do this kind of stuff, of course, uh, game developers, they will join and then they will they, uh, they um, interact with quantum physicists and also uh, game companies, they uh, get interested. But the main message we, are, we need to be able to convey is that quantum physics uh, is not only fun, but is useful as a way of thinking. And so if this is, this message is properly conveyed, I think that uh, uh, it will be, you know, like when uh, for uh, ages, uh, we have been trying to, con to convince uh, companies and convince uh, um, the, the, the job market that uh, a degree in physics <laughs> is especially important <laughs> and especially useful, even though you are not going to work with physics. Uh, in the company, because it's just uh, the capacity, just between quotes, the capacity of problem solving, of thinking in a different manner, and so on and so forth. What the companies who, uh, uh, who have understood this and started hiring physicists, they have, un they have learned that they could really uh, uh, develop uh, uh, their, their, their abilities really uh, by far uh, with respect to, to the, the previous situation. So now we have to, uh, so the second revolution, the second uh, quantum revolution should get into this regime in which everyone is aware about the usefulness of quantum physics, whatever uh, the, uh, the context is. I mean, study physics, you can then do, go do anything. I mean, that yeah. was, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that what the, the thing that I'd like to add to that is, is actually to get back to uh, Zeki's question on, you know, the, the sort of the game development companies and, you know, quantum games and why that link isn't very strong. Um, I mean, we're very lucky at Science at, at Home because we were able to hire developers. And so now we have, you know, folks that, you know, are professional game developers that are helping build these games that I was talking about. Um, but the issue is, um, is it's, it's the same issue that sort of exists around the world with, you know, name, why hasn't problem X been solved? The problem is usually money. Um, so we, uh, for example, if we don't have the money that we get from grants and whatnot, which is how, how this money comes in in, in academia, um, if our grant proposals aren't successful, then we can't hire the developers and we can't build the games. Um, you know, and and and, and then we're, we're sort of we're, we're, we become fairly crippled. Um, and I think that the same problem is why uh, you don't see game development companies operating in the quantum regime is because you know with game development the margins of errors are, are already so thin. You know, you spend a bunch of money developing a game and if the game is a flop, oops, you know. Um, but if you, 
And, and so I think people are typically hesitant to really move into the quantum realm because they say, okay, I don't know anything about quantum. You know, the last educational game that I played that was any fun, I was seven years old. Um, and, you know, I also, you know, all of these academic nerds, they're crazy. Um, and that's, you know, and, and so there has to be some sort of incentive and unfortunately, that incentive is typically financial. Now, you, what I think you will start to see are firms that make educational games moving into the realm of, okay, you know, what do students need to learn? Ah, there's this crazy second quantum revolution. You know, let us, let's see what we can do there. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm really, really pleased to see this event sponsored by you know, a, a gaming, a gaming company in some form. Uh, but I, but I think that it, it, that's really the, the, the path that you have to show is you have to show folks um, in industry for this game development. There's a reason why it's been done mostly at the academic level. It's because I don't actually care if there's a profit. I, in fact, all of these games that I'm, that I develop are free and I would be very angry if I found out somebody was selling quantum moves too. Why would you do that? You know, I, you know that to me, the profit is the education and the spread of the knowledge and all of that. But a, ga- a CEO at a game company doesn't care about that. They want money. And that makes sense. They have to pay their bills. They have to pay their employees, you know, and all of these sorts of things. So uh, I think that if it, you have to provide some sort of incentive there. And that's difficult. So, uh, oh. My, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, carry incentive or otherwise uh, um, some uh, cultural uh, work of ours mm-hmm. that can uh, convince to redirect money because uh, one other if you don't if you cannot get more money you can still uh, redirect the money you have. Yes. Yeah, and actually we 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 that that is that's absolutely I completely agree. So the reason I specifically mentioned the hyper casual genre is that the games there are also free. So they are supported by the ads and the majority of the genre doesn't even do, you know, in purchase, uh, in apps, uh, purchasing things. So in a sense, it is free for the players, but it is supported by the ads. And uh, I, I completely agree with what you say. I mean, these companies don't want to take these risks, which makes a lot of sense. So what we can expect is if there is a hit game that is utilizing some sort of a quantum property, then probably other companies will take notice of it and they will start moving into the field. Yeah, I think at the academic level, you know, we can't make a profit. You know, if we started making a profit, the taxpayers whose money went to our grants would start really screaming. But I think that's a really good point. Is that you can you can fund a lot with, you know, banner ads and whatnot. Yeah, I entirely agree as well. And uh, and also on the fact that uh, if uh, uh, at some point somewhere, for example, with these hackathons uh, or with the jams, uh, et cetera, uh, at some point, uh, uh, games, uh, uh, w- uh, you know, even just one game is created that uh, becomes very popular, then it will be, you know, in the, in the, in the market rules. Then the whole the point, so the, the, the old, uh, point is uh, disappear, yeah, disappears because then at that point it will be the uh, the uh, gain companies uh, uh, who will uh, be quite interested in uh, in creating and realizing uh, uh, quantum games. So we have to to imagine a way of uh, realizing with one of these uh, free initiatives uh, and very and uh, very you know participated initiatives uh, something that is really uh, you know uh, extremely uh, appealing and becomes very popular. I, I, I suspect it will be a an academic or, or a group of academics that start a company and then they you know are able to work with game developers and 
you know, and all of that. And, and, and I, you know, I, I hope that would come because I think that would really bolster the quantum network. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, and uh, I want to continue with one of my other questions because I'm really curious about this thing. Uh, uh, during the presentation of Anand and Anna Maria, they mentioned that almost half of the games that we have found were adapted from classical games, but the other half was not. So what do you think about this? Is a, some sort of a quantization of certain classical games a good approach for quantum games? I have not a definite idea. <laughs> Not a definite answer. Uh, there are goods and bads in the, in the, in the two choices because uh, if you start from a classical, it's something that is already popular. And so maybe it can, uh, can be more appealing for uh, those, uh, for, I mean, for gamers, for players who would like to, to try. Um, on the other side, uh, if you the the, the, the bad uh, starting with the classical is the, is that uh, you keep comparing uh, and with what you're doing with the quantum game uh, with respect to the classical rules, and so somehow you create since the very beginning a kind of constraint that is not good when uh, one would like to. Uh, learn thinking in a quantum manner. So there are goods and bads, I, I, I would say. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, a, a, a quantum version of a classical game can be fun because then it can allow people to sort of, they have intuition about a classical game and if you give it a quantum twist, then maybe they can learn a little bit about the quantum aspect of you know, or, or, or the, you know, the, the quantum weirdness that makes it a little bit different. But at the same time, typically the analogy only goes so far. Um, and so, uh, and there is a, something to be said for originality and fun. Yeah, uh, I also agree. And I think that's why we have a 50-50 situation. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we can answer this question and I think it's very interesting and maybe even a, a little bit too optimistic question, but how long do you think it will take for the emergence of personally played game quantum computers? So gaming computers, but for quantum games. Will it mean, ever be a reality? Do you mean quantum computers for playing quantum games yes carry <laughs> i pass <laughs> it's going to be a while if it ever happens uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah i i think I, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of quantum computing hype um and uh, so a good bit of it is 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 well deserved but i think uh it's um Oh man, if this is going to go on YouTube, do I really want to say what I really think? <laughs> um, I think there's a bit of a quantum computing bubble. And I think actually most uh, physicists would agree with that. Um, it's, yeah. it's really, really cool, interesting technology that has a lot of potential applications. And it's, it's really, I mean, the, the approaches people are taking to making qubits and making them better and move us out of this sort of noisy intermediate scale quantum era, I mean, are amazing. But if you read a popular science article saying that, ah, yes, you know, this is going to be a quantum computer in, in, in you know, two years, you're, they're probably wrong. Um, and I don't like to necessarily be a super naysayer. Um, but there, all of those you should take, I saw, I saw a headline the other day on Twitter that was, you know, that was actually exactly that, you know, that quantum computers will be able to fit in your hand. Maybe they will one day, but there, there's a long way to go before we take what we have 
and it becomes widespread in industry. And it's really, you know, it, it's not just an engineering problem. I mean, it is a physics problem, but there's a lot of engineering that goes into that to making sure those qubits are robust and stable and, you know, uh, that errors are corrected and whatnot. But then there's a huge jump from, you know, sort of the, you know, you can think about it with our classical computer, right? They used to fill rooms and they it's called a computer bug because, you know, they literally pulled the moth out of a machine once. And, and you know, so th there's a jump there. I would say we're looking at decades, mm -hmm. multiple. Can I be provocative? <laughs> oh, I, I might, I, I might, be, you know, <laughs> have no career as a result of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, you have to listen to what I'm going to say. So uh, I can be, uh, my situation can be becoming worse. Um, so maybe uh, we cannot uh, uh, accept it or afford it for, you know, um, uh, for composing a, uh, a molecule uh, uh, in, for pharmaceutical reasons uh, on a quantum computer or to solve a, an important logistic problem and so on and so forth. But maybe for quantum games, we could um, tell the uh, companies uh, who are committed in building uh, uh, quantum computers that we can also accept uh, uh, smaller quantum volume uh, computers, even if they have flaws and errors. Uh, it's a game and uh, it will be part of the game. That's a very good point. I mean, the, uh, the you know, Deku Doku and, and those other uh, games that were sort of built and pioneered by James Wooten and, and, and have sort of, you know, grown into this huge suite of games based on, say, for example, the Kiz Kit. I mean, they use what we have now. So if yeah. we make what we have now small, then maybe we'll have the Nintendo DS Quantum. Yeah. So <laughs> your optimism is, uh, yeah. We are I launching like an idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm in, let's do it. Yeah, let, let, let's hope that in 10 years we meet again and we say that, oh, that things accelerated very rapidly that we didn't expect them to be. Um, okay, so I think there's another problem with my connection and it is trying to tell us that we should stop. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, I really want to thank time. you again it's for two hours time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I I really want to thank you again uh, for accepting our invitation and for this great uh, panel. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you, and uh, I think the ideas that we put forward here would be helpful to some of the uh, listeners, but mainly for us because. Uh, we are working in this field and uh, I am really, really uh, excited about the community aspect of this thing because every day that we are hearing and we are finding out certain new people that are going into this field that become interested in this and through this kind of community effort, uh, I, I think things will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, Certainly not two, two years, but uh, let's hope that we don't have to wait until the 22nd century for a quantum uh, gaming laptop, let's say. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, can I can I thank uh, uh, Zeki and uh, all uh, the organizers? I didn't do it at the very beginning uh, for... Uh, inviting um, me, I mean, as a representative of Cupid Learn, and in fact, uh, greetings from all the Cupid Learn crew uh, to this interesting uh, um, to this interesting uh, initiative, uh, and uh, we, which opens uh, up to the hackathons that will be in September, and uh, every one of us uh, looks forward uh, to it. And uh, also, I mean, an invitation to stay tuned about uh, all the all the stuff we're doing with, within the pilot uh, and the pilots of the quantum technology education initiative uh, 
uh, I think we have in front of us uh, one, uh, two, three, a number of years that will be of fun, as Kerry was pointing out. Yes, I'd like to echo the thanks. Thanks to the listeners. Thank you, Zeki. Thank you, Mailu. Thank you to all the pr presenters. I just, yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the participants as well. And if you have any questions, if you want to add something, any comments, you can uh, turn on your mics, you can turn on your camera and uh, speak now. Marlou's dog has something. My, yeah. my, my dog, not too. <laughs> my dog is the head has something to say. They hear about quantum physics all day, so they, <laughs> they are prepared. Uh, I had a, a last question uh, related uh, to the bubble. <laughs> So, uh, do you think that the bubble could break if uh, the industry uh, comes to work with this? Or what do you think about the bubble? Because it's very uh, many people are working and thinking about this. Like, Um, I'm very confident about, about, about the fact that it will happen and actually that this will happen soon and it is already happening actually and uh, it will happen soon. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm witnessing about uh, or also large companies uh, in Italy, telecommunication companies, for example, who uh, started to, to understand the importance of quantum technologies, so even in um, even in, in a kind of um, tools uh, that they already uh, are using uh, in the classical version and that can be turned into the quantum version. So I think that, uh, we, I mean, we really need uh, to keep going with this uh, important work we're doing very, very slow and uh, and, uh, and also uh, not easy work of um, outreaching uh, and uh, creating awareness about uh, quantum technologies so that we're doing also within the European Union uh, uh, quantum flagship. Uh, and we have to be a bit patient, but I'm convinced uh, that, uh, that the things will uh, rapidly evolve in the next years. I, uh, I I think that what what I, what I think is being ignored is that the quantum second quantum revolution isn't just computing, and so that's really my 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 biggest um, gripe with with uh, with the, the the focus on quantum computing is that I, I think actually if you ask me what's closest to real commercial. Um, real commercial applicability, it's sensing. Uh, sensing and, and metrology. Um, and, 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 and I say that because there are, um, but, it, but it's not, you know, it, it, there's a question in the chat about, you know, whether or not the international banking system will need to change if a, if a high performance quantum computer emerges. Um, and so, it, it, and it's questions like that, that make quantum computing, you know, for lack of a better term, sexy. Um, but really, the um, and, and I, I, as I wrote in the chat, I don't know enough to answer that concretely. Um, but but sensing and timekeeping, and even to an extent simulation, you know, these other pillars of, of the European quantum flagship, um, they're really they shouldn't be ignored. And so, you know, I, I and, and I think that there are uh, there there's a lot of potential within that as well. And so just because it's not a, not a qubit, um, it, it shouldn't be ignored. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Quantum technologies as itself is causing the second quantum revolution. So not just quantum computers. And uh, if I can add a uh, uh, comment on what Kerry uh, and Zeki said, uh, uh, 
in order to um, to to uh, avoid this ignorance, uh, one has to start since uh, the very beginning. Uh, so quantum technologies uh, were born within uh, the general um, uh, have been developed, uh, conceived and developed within uh, the, the the context of. Uh, atomic uh, physics and condensed matter physics, uh, very generally speaking, okay? Uh, but um, condensed matter physics uh, has never been recognized as uh, a, a part of physics uh, that is important for, uh, for uh, quantum stuff, but just for ordinary materials, uh, etc. Um, so, uh, while at this moment, the condensed matter physics is somehow at the center of the stage, uh, precisely because of the quantum technologies. Uh, of course, it's not the only one, because then there is quantum information and, uh, and, and, and all the interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary uh, research that is uh, uh, being, being done uh, and carried out. And so, um, I think that uh, the other point that we have to take care of uh, is uh, about uh, making clear that, that not, not just physics is uh, only one, uh, is a way of thinking and is uh, one uh, huge uh, uh, part of science, but also that uh, science in general is now all interconnected. So physics is interconnected with biology, with medicine, with uh, neuroscience uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, e uh, economic sciences, uh, with social sciences. And so um, going along this direction, that again uh, is a cultural uh, challenge for, uh, for us as academics, uh, for outreaching, for educating uh, since the very beginning. I think that this uh, can help uh, operating the changes that Anna Maria was asking for. I agree. Education, outreach, yeah. those are keys. And uh, maybe this was the last last question I, I swear. So uh, maybe uh, you uh, talk about making quantum mechanics uh, known to the public, right? Like how can general public be interested by quantum mechanics? But how can we do that academics uh, are interested about teaching to the public or talking to the public. Because I think that there is like a division there. So I don't know if we could talk about it. Um, it, it we have to start, um, it, it, it comes down to, I think, um, it comes down to starting at starting starting young in the academic career um and so for example i mean again to, just to, not to blow our own horn but we did some work here in denmark um on actually training phd students in quantum physics to do outreach you know what did that look like and and, and you know in my own phd career i only got that training because i sought it out um because i did volunteer outreach work and I'd say 90 to 95% of my peers didn't because they didn't. Um, and I think that regardless of how well you do, you're always going to find people who say, oh, I don't need to do this. This isn't useful. This is just takes time away from my super important research that's going to change the world. And, you know, okay, that's their problem, you know. Um, but I think increasingly we have to push people to understand, push people in academia to understand that it's not just getting the results for making your, um, for, for making an amazing quantum computer or, you know, making a, an amazing atomic clock or whatnot, but it's, it's communicating about what you do, why you do it and what it's good for to the public. Um, because I think that's a, that's a really strong way to combat anti-intellectualism that I see you know, very rampant around the world, but especially in my home country, so I'm from the US. And um, you, know, you have to, one of the most important things to understand is that academics are normal people. 
um, by and large. Like, you know, we might really, really like lasers in my point and, and, you know, in, in my case, but we're by and large pretty normal people that do normal things. And we have people, you know, families and, and, and people that we love and, and hobbies and whatnot. Um, and I think that, that that sometimes gets lost. And, and so you really have to connect the quantum and the human side of things. And I think this, this gets a, to what Marlou was talking about, but you also have to incentivize outreach because if you incentivize outreach, you'll get more people doing outreach. And I, I think grant agency, funding agencies are doing this as well. Um, and once you get more people doing outreach, you will get people for example, in this training network, we had people who hated it at the very beginning. They were like, why am I doing this? And then at the very end, they were just like, this is awesome. This is super fun. And so if you get more people doing outreach, you'll get more buy-in for why outreach is important. And then you'll you know, have more out net outreach. I entirely agree with Carrie, uh, and I mean, any single word she said, um, I can add that uh, uh, most uh, uh, scientists who are involved in outreach, of course, at the moment, uh, do this for fun. It, it is, I mean, for example, I do it just because I have a lot of fun. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. I mean, the chronological time that it takes uh, is really nothing in front of the, of the timely time, of the opportune time, of the fun I have that opens my mind with respect to my research. Because uh, one uh, point is that uh, when uh, one one fi finds and tries ways to outreach uh, complicated messages, then uh, that, that is a, a really nice way of make clear minds about uh, what one is doing first. Uh, second, uh, what is uh, often overlooked about outreach is that outreach is not just uh, uh, that is would, would already be enough uh, uh, about elevating the average culture of uh, and education of normal people, but it is also uh, to to make uh, uh, those who take political decisions aware about what is important. If they are not able to understand the importance of what you're doing, you can have the most wonderful and uh, transformative uh, idea uh, in your physics research, either uh, theoretical or experimental, but nobody will understand it, nobody will uh, understand its importance, and nobody will fund it unless uh, you have funds because uh, you, I mean, you are a, a very powerful uh, person for other reasons. Sometimes it happens, uh, uh, but it's not the, the <laughs> fortunately, it's not the usual manner. Yeah, if I was independently no. wealthy, I'd still shoot lasers at things, but most yeah. people don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. So, uh, so, and and uh, the, those who take the po political decisions, I mean, they are not all Angela Merkel, who has a PhD in physics. Usually, they are uh, lawyers. Usually, they are uh, philosophers. Okay, and where are these uh, persons trained? They are trained in our universities. And they are trained in our high schools, in our middle schools, in our primary schools, and in our kindergartens. So we are working with Reggio children to bring quantum physics into kindergartens. For these reasons, and also because kids have that imaginative and creative way of thinking that can help us understanding what to do with quantum physics. I just want to say I agree. It's not just the general yeah. public. It's, uh, you know. And of course, uh, as uh, Kerry was saying, one has also to give incentives and also to make rules. So for example, in Italy, uh, outreach is uh, uh, starting to be one of the criteria with which uh, uh, academics uh, are uh, evaluated, Ac academic performance is evaluated. 
So, of course, if you start uh, introducing uh, these uh, assessment tools uh, and uh, you say that um, outreaching is an impor important uh, uh, part of your activity besides research and besides teaching, then, of course, uh, those who at the beginning don't do outreach because they, uh, they, they do not have fun to do it, they will start to do it. And then, as Kerry pointed out, eventually they will say, oh, it's awesome. Why I didn't start <laughs> before? <laughs> Earlier, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, not everybody is going to feel like I do, where I feel like I have a moral obligation to, to give outreach, you know, because it, it was people that did that for me or because I'm is that's why I'm here and so I want to pay it forward but if you if you incentivize then I think everybody there are many different ways of doing outreach you don't necessarily have to talk on a panel or you don't necessarily have to you know um go out to high schools and whatnot there are many different ways that you can do outreach um and I, I think it's, it's very important to both disseminate you know your research results which most researchers really love but then also to to inform the public about what you're doing. Yeah, and maybe I can add one, one of the outreach examples is Scott Aronson's blog. And he has been writing that blog for quite some time. And it has helped a lot of people to figure out what is going on in the field of quantum computing, especially after this, you know, supremacy or quantum computational advantage stuff, because people went and read Scott's blog. Uh, and I know that some people do not enjoy giving talks. Some people are not maybe as social as uh, others. But uh, I completely agree with, agree with what Kerry said. There are many different forms of outreach and people can do, especially researchers can do any kind of uh, outreach that they want. Because I know that there are certain pushback uh, to this idea of integrating outreach uh, into the criteria for scientific research or, or funding of this scientific research. I, I think if you're and publicly funded, you should. Yeah, and, but also we need to, outreach doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and talk in front of a lot of people. Okay. This is true. I, I, you, you came back just now. I completely yeah. agree, Zick. Me too. <clears throat> Okay, so if you have any uh, last comments, we should uh, take those. And if not, we should stop. Yeah. It's always on the days that you have something important that your internet decides that it doesn't feel no like right? <laughs> Don't worry, Zaki. Uh, everything yeah. has, uh, has gone into the right place eventually. <laughs> yeah, no, I, Zaki, I think, I think this went more. So, Kerry and I, we are going to close uh, the session, right, <laughs> Kerry? <laughs> In place of Zaki. <laughs> yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, it has been really very awesome. It's been an honor and a pleasure. For me too. Thanks, Azeki. Right, thanks, thanks, Powell, and everyone else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a so, wonderful day, evening, wherever you are in the yeah. world. And weekend. <laughs> Ciao, everyone. Ciao, Kari. Ciao. 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 Ciao.